Alan Kersner. I head up the Temple University Entrepreneurship Academy, which is focused on spreading entrepreneurial thinking and doing throughout Temple University to enable people to deal with the increasing uncertainty of the world and also to have more control over their financial destinies. Tonight is a welcome kickoff of our 2021 freelancing series, which is focused on helping all of you, whether you be an artist, musician, journalist, consultant, tutor, independent healthcare provider, or anything else, explore and achieve your goals in the gig economy. Today's introductory panel will be followed by four more topic specific sessions, with the first being February 22nd, where we will be focusing on brand building, how to brand yourself and your business, gaining clients through specific networking activities and social media. And I will uh, send right now the chat for everyone to register for the following four workshops. The next workshop is going to be on money management. That's March 1st. And this is the one topic that is cited most often by alumni who have done freelancing and they say, boy, I wish I had learned more about how to manage finances while I was in college. So we will have a session March 1st to further your understanding in this area. On March 8th, we'll be covering legal issues. And then on the 15th, you'll be working to put together your plan for the first 90 days of your business or your relaunched business. I am also very excited to announce that beginning end of March and April, we are launching our first ever mini accelerator to work individually with 12 to 15 people to help them launch or relaunch their businesses. You will learn and actually practice in the real world how to build and communicate your brand and your products and services, how to price what you provide, and what many of us find the toughest task, how to sell face to face. The culmination of this workshop, of this, I'm sorry, mini accelerator, is going to be a showcase where participants present their businesses to the Temple community and the Philadelphia community and are then featured on a new Temple freelancing website. Now this is gonna be by invite only. So members will be chosen by a selection committee. And one requirement is attendance at three of the five first sessions that we are having. So by being here today, you're one third of the way to this requirement. We will provide additional details over the next couple weeks, but I would urge as many of you as possible to apply to this. It is really a unique opportunity in the freelancing area. Okay, now to get to the reason we are all here today. As Lindsay mentioned, after our panel discussion, we will take audience questions so feel free to put them in chat and we will retrieve them. So I am privileged to introduce our panel, which right now consists of Joshua Lee and Jeff Anson. 
And I'd like to start by asking each of them to talk about what they majored in college and what they are doing right now. So Joshua, would you like to lead off? Sure. Hey everybody, um, I'm Josh Lee. I graduated undergrad with music performance in 2016. And I graduated with master's in uh, music, music performance, jazz performance in 2019. And uh, currently I'm uh, running a nonprofit organization called Jazz Lives Philadelphia. And our, our mission is to promote uh, jazz in Philly through education, community outreach and performance. And we've been going to Philadelphia area schools since around 2015 and promoting a unique concert series around the city. And uh, we're gearing up for the reopening of live music and uh, probably this fall, uh, even 2022. And uh, currently we're, uh, we shifted our focus online and we're uh, interviewing the, the Philly community, the Philly jazz community. And um, I'm also a, a saxophonist and I play professionally uh, with a couple different bands. And uh, yeah, so I kind of split my time between nonprofit work and freelancing as a musician. Great, thank you. Jeff? All right, hey, it's a pleasure to uh, be here for everyone today. I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Um, so I was all over the place in college. I, as you can see from the degrees behind me, I studied biology, philosophy, and political science because I liked them all and couldn't make up my mind. Um, I uh, took that to a master's in bioethics and a PhD in political science, which I finished in December of 2019. So one of the perspectives I'm bringing here today is from someone who studied a lot of different things. I eventually found my way towards consulting, which is I work for the firm ZS Associates now, who has an office in Philadelphia, and um, kind of bringing together a lot of different experiences, trying to make something of it, figure out how those parts become a greater whole. Um, Another experience I'm happy to reflect on if people are interested or have questions is job hunting during COVID because I know that that's a daunting and uncertain thing. I hit the market kind of right as the COVID uncertainty was at its highest and I could definitely share insights there as well, just sort of how to keep the, the boat afloat until you figure out what you want to be doing long-term. Thank you. Great. Okay, Joshua. You had previously told me that you went from playing gigs in New York for a hundred bucks a night to being in the Count Basie Orchestra. First, for the younger members of our audience, can you explain who Count Basie is and the role he played in jazz and big band? And then, how you went from making a hundred bucks a night in New York, and if you're commuting from Philly, I'm sure you were left with about $8 at the end of the gig. And how you went from that to playing in the Count Basie uh, Orchestra. So uh, I wish it was a hundred bucks a night. It was <laughs> more around 20. But uh, anyway, so um, I guess a mini jazz history lesson. Um, there's a uh, jazz kind of came to be as American popular music in the early 20s, coming from ragtime, coming from New Orleans, a lot of different influences I don't have time to get into. But um, in, the, in the 20s, the 30s, there's this thing called the swing era when there's a lot of big bands. And uh, Count Basie was a, he, he was from New Jersey, but he ended up inheriting a band from Kansas City in 1935. And the band still plays today and travels the world. Um, we were supposed to travel a lot last year, but COVID happened. And uh, I joined in 2018, and uh, it's one of the the last standing bands of that era that consistently has been tour touring for 85, 86 years. And um, yeah, so uh, there's there's a there's a thing in the in, in the music world called uh, paying your dues and uh, being in the trenches. So a lot of my heroes, how they got to where they were, is. Uh, they did. They just played. They didn't really care how much money it was. Just the experience of playing and the knowledge that you learn from playing with, especially with older musicians, is really invaluable. So that's something I tried to do. And yeah, as I said before, I wish it was a hundred bucks. That would be <laughs> that would be pretty cool. But uh, it was it was definitely I thought of it as an investment in uh, education. 
And uh, one of the bands I played with, uh, unbeknownst to me, one of the, um, I played with this band for about two years. And uh, one of the trombone players happened to be the eldest member of the Count Basie Orchestra. And he said, hey, man, you got your passport? I got a gig for you. So I didn't know what was going on. And eventually I got the email and it was, it was pretty crazy. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of that story. Okay, great. Okay, so after t with twenty bucks a night, you probably ended up in a deficit after. Oh, of course, yeah. But is is out of love? Is 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 all out of love? The music. Great, great. Now, Jeff, you've done a number of very interesting activities that built upon each other to get you where you are today in consulting. Can you talk about those activities and whether your journey was pre-planned? or uh, you're snickering okay so maybe not so can you take us through that yeah absolutely so i'm happy to walk through the steps but um one thing that josh just said that i think i, I really want to reflect on as i kind of recount this journey is that willingness to jump in and you know embrace whatever experience is offered to you even if maybe the money isn't what you want it to be or it's not the perfect match for your interests um I think I think paying your dues is a concept that makes that is synergistic with a lot of career paths beyond just music. That everyone needs to start somewhere and needs to start getting experience. So my path was not at all pre-planned, and to be honest, I don't think my future is pre-planned either. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I like the adventure of knowing where I'm going to figure out um, and wind up next. But I, out of undergrad, um, was very interested in social sciences, hard sciences applied ethics, um, got into bioethics from that, and, you know, really found it as an area where I had a lot of intellectual passion. I felt like, like a lot of the questions bioethicists ask about, you know, what's right for patients, how we ethically conduct medical research, what the future of medicine should look like, asking these normative questions, was, was really kind of, you know, my passion project. Um, but it wasn't a master's where I had a clear path out or a clear next step. So. I learned while I was there that in order to do a lot with a terminal master's, like a bioethics uh, degree, you need some kind of a doctoral level credential. And I decided to make that a doctor of uh, political science and started down that pathway kind of right afterwards without really taking time to get the real world experience that I probably could have benefited from, but really just doubling down to the academics. I was lucky enough while I was doing my PhD to have the opportunity to serve as founding assistant director for Temple's public policy master's program. And I think that that was one of my first real opportunities, um, kind of like being asked to join the orchestra of like, you know, maybe it wasn't the seat at the table that I had always dreamed of, but it was, would you like a seat at the table to sit with some people who are thinking about designing an academic program to ask these hard questions, but as, you know, a, a student part of the faculty. And that was really, I think, where I started to developed the professional skills that eventually led me towards um, my current job in consulting. I had some other experiences along the way that I think were really important as well. I had opportunities to do adjunct teaching. Um, I was able to teach at Rutgers as well as Temple, so I learned another institution, another kind of set of norms there. I worked with Temple's um, Digital Scholarship Center, now the Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio to do um, student teaching in coding and natural language processing, again, which was kind of an opportunity to have a seat at the table, to have those conversations, to get integrated with another set of skills. And ultimately I was able to kind of, you know, pull all that together into a resume and bring it to a couple of consulting firms, including ZS where I work now and say, I have all these different things in my background and I've cobbled them together in a way that makes sense to me. This is why I think I'm the guy for the job for you and you know, that's what ultimately got me the position. So it was definitely not a linear path, but I think the challenge is not always knowing where you're going looking forward, but knowing how to make sense of your past and sell yourself on the next step of the journey. Okay, good. So if I can, you both sort of mention similar things about putting yourself in situations. You know, Jeff, you called it a seat at the table. Joshua, you talked about paying your dues. How do you figure out what the right tables are that you should try to sit at? And in a way, you know, this to me is almost a type of networking that you're both talking about. So can you both address that? 
Well, um, the way I think about it is um, to, to be in the, in, in the music is to be very passionate about it. And uh, if you find a subsection of the music that really speaks to you and then you see older people or people your age, whoever, doing what you want to do, you just have to be do everything in your power to be around them. Without and the, I think the key part is not to expect any type of rewards or uh, in in music, not to expect a gig by just showing up and, and hanging, but actually making an attempt to learn. Because th that's kind of what I did. Um, there's this place called the, the Vanguard, as one of the oldest clubs is in New York. So I'll take the mega bus every Monday to go down uh, to hear the set. Because uh, fortunately for the Temple Jazz students, um, a lot of the faculty are some of the most incredible musicians in the world. And uh, that's what they preach. They say, go out and listen and, and be around and without really expecting anything, but just kind of kind of be there. So for a couple of years, I still do it. I would be I would be there tonight if, if it wasn't for COVID. But, uh, you know, just kind of going and and just surrounding yourself with with uh, with the wisdom of the people who came before, because in music, um, a lot of other things. But uh, there's a there's a really strong oral tradition to music that you can't learn you can't really pick up in school so you can only spend so much time in the practice room practicing licks but you actually have to go out and listen to music and also you have to go out and talk to the people who've done it who've been around the world a million times but really won't say anything about it until you ask them and and what i found is that um the elders of the, of the music in philly new york wherever around the world um if they see young people really interested about what they do, they just open right up. And it's, you know, there is, there, the, the information just flows. All you have to do is ask and just have the confidence to ask. And, and yeah, and I've seen that. And um, our, our panelists from the fine arts area have also commented on that. You know, a lot of people who are in the industry and have been there for a while really love working with young, energetic, passionate people. So I, I think that's a great thought. Jeff? Yeah, I, I think that um, my experience is synergized with those in a lot of ways, but maybe a little less so in others. Um, you know, if the question is, how do you figure out which table you want to be sitting at? I, I think that the most important thing to do is look at the people you respect, look at people who have been your mentors in the past and figure out what they did to get where they are, what tables they sat at. But that doesn't mean that that's necessarily the recipe for success for you. So I think the other piece of it is kind of enthusiastically failing early and often. Just try to get a seat at whatever table you think might be the right one and see if they're your people or not. You'll know once you get there. And um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of people in the world that are really open and are really eager to be a mentor, but that's not always going to be the case. But kind of wherever you are, if you can find one person who can be a mentor, often, you know, your time with that person will help you gain the confidence to build relationships with other people and, you know, expand your network organically, you know, using those people who are eager to work with you as a little bit of a launching pad to building those broader sets of relationships. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to change uh, topics a little bit. There are a number of people attending tonight who are not sure whether they want to do something on their own or go get a full-time job somewhere. How should people think through these choices? And what are key factors in terms of personality, financial status, etc.? that they should bring into this decision? I'd be happy to start with that one. Um, I think that the, the lens that I take for that most strongly is having come out of a PhD program. Um, there's always this tension of if you're going to try to make your life about teaching, do you get the tenure track job where you have kind of a full-time position at a university and a teaching responsibility, or do you look to adjunct teach and more kind of cobble things together. You can be a lot more interpretive. You have a lot more power over kind of what schools you want to teach, maybe pick, trying to pick and choose classes, but you lose a lot of control in other areas too. And so it's, do I kind of 
give one person a lot of power over my life in terms for the kind of guarantee of maybe a higher salary, more security, or do I focus on doing what I want to do first and, and make it work on the other end? Um, I think that that in itself is a really hard decision to make. And, um, you know, things like adult things like having healthcare and benefits can turn out to be really important. And you can miss those things if you don't have them. There is a third way though, which is to have a job, you know, that's kind of like your, your bread and butter, the thing you do day, you know, during your nine to five work day, but then you can do things that bring you joy and excitement on the side. Um, I'm going to be doing some teaching on the side. So, you know, just one class here and there, but I still have the full-time consulting. I have another um, professional colleague and mentor of mine who has some data projects that are her passion projects. And it's not something she's necessarily getting paid for, but she's, you know, this is what brings her joy and gets her, you know, her passion for what the work she's doing day to day there. And, you know, one day she's going to be able to leverage that to turn that into the next career that's really going to be centered around what engages her the most. So I think that it doesn't have to be all one or the other. And there's a couple of different ways you can kind of find that third path in between them also. Okay, good. Yeah, I definitely agree with Jeff that uh, it can be kind of a difficult decision. Um, just from my personal experience, um, I had an opportunity to join a couple of the military bands. And uh, I guess uh, the military jazz bands that travel and play for the president and everything. That was maybe four years ago or so. And um, I was going to do the audition and, and, um, but I, I was talking to my, my mentors at Temple and people I really trust. And they, 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 um, what Jeff said, you kind of relinquish control over what you want to do because you're literally in the military, even though technically it's in the grand scheme of things, there's not much, there's not many musical positions maybe besides Philly Orchestra or one of those high class orchestras that really give you the security to have that position for the rest of your life. But you kind of relinquish control to do what you really, uh, really enjoy doing. And uh, another, another thing, um, I actually went to grad school first for music education after, uh, right after undergrad and um, Terrell Stafford, one of my heroes and mentors, uh, he, he really brought the question to me and he said, are you doing this because you want to have a fallback or do you really, really, really love teaching and really, really want to teach kids? Because if you don't, then I don't want you teaching my kids. So that's something that, that always sticks with me. If you're not 100% passion, passionate about what you want to do, um, then maybe, you know, I mean, of course, not everything's solid and it takes some time to, to formulate things. Like there's these things I would never even imagine even being in the position of being a military band. And a couple years, uh, a couple months later, actually, I got a chance to go into basic band. So I'm glad I've withheld that. But I mean, you just never know. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, good. So now for each of you personally, What's the professional success you're most proud of? Uh, well, I guess what I'm most proud of is uh, I mentioned the Vanguard. So they, they, they have a band called the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, which has been around since 1966. And it's been one of the greatest bands of all time. And I'm a huge fanboy. And a lot of the teachers at Temple <laughs> play in the band. And uh, actually, got the sub in the band starting in 2017 and uh because i built a relationship with the baritone player who's my all-time hero so he lets me fill in for him sometimes and uh, i got to travel uh the country with him a couple times and um recently last i guess 2019 that was something that i'll never i'll never forget because i was playing with my heroes all-time heroes great jeff yeah, um, this is probably not going to surprise anyone, but it, it's hard to not have finishing a dissertation be your most, power, uh, most powerful and proud professional moment for a good part of your career, and it definitely is for me. Um, in it, for me, it was not just having, you know, put in the work to do something really big, but also all the learning that takes place along the way, all of the 
you know, problems I had to figure out a new solution to and roadblocks I hit and had to find a way around and learning how to combine, in my particular case, some text analysis methods to get at one particular thing I was trying to. Um, it, it was it was a labor of love, but it was also always kind of a labor of creativity and and fun for me. And and so I think that that's going to be you know at the top of the heap for a while yet. But I'm looking forward to you know that big consulting experience where I you know finish some huge project and I'm like you know I think that that unseats the dissertation. It'll happen one day. Okay, great. Now we know that being a gig musician or whatever, a freelance musician, being a consultant, you know, being an artist or journalist or whatever, as a freelancer is not all success. So what are the two biggest challenges or obstacles you've each faced? Um, one thing for me is uh, definitely time management because uh, there's so much that we could be doing. And it will, especially for me, my time management was pretty awful. And uh, you kind of want to throw yourself in a million different directions at once. But really focusing in on one thing is, I think, a lot more meaningful than trying to spread yourself out, spread yourself way too thin. And um, just the, sometimes it can get pretty, pretty dark, <laughs> you know, just keep the motivation that, I mean, you're doing it not for to feed your own ego, but to to propel the music into the next hundred years. So it's not that that's definitely something I learned from people like Terrell Stafford and the Dick Oates, the people who work at Temple. But uh, yeah, it's something that definitely keeps me going, and it, it's something that involves uh, the greater community of musicians, especially in Philly. It's such a tight knit community that um, has real motivation. But yeah, I would say just keeping the motivation, time management, and and uh, yeah, that's some of the two problems I can think of right now. Okay, so Joshua, let me follow up. What's the biggest failure you've had? Oh man, this is a <laughs> well. Let's see. A lot of times, you know, you get to uh, you you're playing in a a position in a band that you you know like the Basie Band or something like that. Actually, no, I have a, I have a story. Um, so I, I went on the road with, um, the first time I ever traveled was with uh, this band leader named Delphio Marsalis. And uh, if you're familiar with Wynton Marsalis, he's kind of the king of jazz, but this is his brother. And the first time I ever went on the road was in New Orleans. And uh, I went up to take a solo and um, he basically yelled at me because I was listening to the recording and I wasn't following directions. And he's like, nah, sit down, young man, stop it. Sit. And it was really embarrassing. But one of the things that I've learned is that those moments, um, especially in music, those moments pretty much only stick to you and the people around you at the moment don't really remember them at all. So uh, it, it, it's kind of failure. I mean, that happens so many times. I've, I mean, you get burned, you know. <laughs> it's, it's just a part of learning how to play music. So what, what it's taught me is that um, it's great to, to reach for perfection, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's kind of futile to, to beat yourself up if you're not perfect because odds are the people who you messed up around don't even remember, you know. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, too many of those little fa failures to count. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, I actually, I'm really glad that Joshua went here because this was going to be the biggest thing I, I think I have to contribute as well. And I already said it once, but the kind of fail fast and often mentality. Um, I think that one of my biggest failures in writing my dissertation was being too scared to kind of put my foot down, put myself out there, say, you know, this is where I want to land. What do you think? Get feedback and kind of iterate. There was a lot of equivocating and while well, I'm not quite sure yet, I still have to do this more work or that more. And, you know, getting that constant feedback of like, just write something, get it out there. I think that that mentality is so important in life. Of, um, and and it, it's not um, acting without purpose. It's not just doing things to do them, but it's making your best effort, giving it a try, knowing that sometimes <clears throat> it's going to flop. And this is kind of the, 
the you know, thing that Joshua was talking about, but finding the motivation to kind of keep going between those, you have peaks, but there's going to be lulls too, and finding the motivation to keep going is really important and really challenging. Um, I think the other one is, certainly as I was moving through my academic and professional career, and I think this is going to be true for most people most of the time, there's going to be new sets of skills and new requirements in every job you have. And taking kind of, taking comfort and pride in what you're bringing to the table, but also trying to adapt quickly and figuring out who you need to be right now in order to be successful in this new environment is a constant challenge. And I think one that's probably even more likely to be something as important for freelancers than anybody else. Okay, All right. so, you know, COVID is here. Hopefully it will be minimized soon. But obviously COVID has had an impact on the live arts, performing arts. We see that, we see all these venues in trouble. We see musicians and comedians and theatrical performers lose their venues to perform at. And also from a consulting standpoint, you know, a lot of clients aren't spending money consulting. Um, so, well, I know in your particular instance, Jeff, that's not true. So you get to talk about that. But tell me how, how you two and then other people you see who are, you know, freelancing or sole proprietors, how they're adapting to COVID to sort of minimize the hit to their businesses. Well, it was it was really interesting. The first couple of months of COVID, from March to June, um, on social media and just by calling my friends, there was a huge lack of creativity, and everybody just seemed so depressed and not willing to. You know, people who would practice all day just kind of stopped playing, and I, I wasn't any different. And um, I feel like that creativity has kind of flowed back into the scene. And also in the beginning, the very beginning, everybody was really focused on live streaming um, from their houses. And, and, and people quickly found out that that in a way kind of cheapens the music. If you're live streaming yourself out for free, uh, what would anybody really need to see you live for? They have hours and hours of you playing archive forever. So that kind of, uh, balanced out. Now there's there's kind of a there's kind of a, I guess it reached an equilibrium of of paid live performances and and free um, content. And actually, I'm part of the free content. Uh, I mentioned before um, interviewing a lot of people. So we started interviewing for Jazz with Philadelphia at the end of May, and uh, I think we're on episode this Friday. We're going to be on episode 26 or 25 or something like that. And we're just starting our, our third round of interviews and it's been a, um, it's been great. Um, we've been, you know, it's, it's like freelancing. It's been a, a we're a nonprofit organization. So it's, it's really a labor of love and this is not really a lucrative business. And we've been going together uh, through hard work and <laughs> determination and, and very kind donations. And um, it has been really awesome to see the community on social media come together for you know every friday a couple you know 30 40 50 people get together and just reminisce about uh philadelphia jazz and we we learn so much and there's a lot of people who actually are still uh playing and, and making amazing original music like there's a saxophone player named emmanuel wilkins he's from philly and i just saw him he was just on nbr's tiny desk he's incredible he played with me in the basic band for a minute but he's taking the music to the next level so there's there's people on his end who found a way to safely um produce music uh in this in this time and there's been a lot of people who've been creative and how they they get sponsorships and create programming Well, I, I hate feeling like I'm always just piggybacking off stuff, stuff Joshua says, but I, I feel like, um, you know, there's just, uh, there's a lot of shared wisdom across all points in the world. And 
um, while my particular industry and my particular you know pharma consulting is really big right now because pharma companies have a lot of problems and they need consultants help. Um, you know, there are a lot of places that are struggling, including consulting firms. And I think what I would say broadly is try to lean into where the opportunities are and try to figure out where those are. You know, if you're not sure, it might be that doing one thing isn't the opportunity that it was in the past, but that you can, you know, find some way to pivot or tilt. I think Joshua was talking about a lot of those. The other one, um, and, you know, I was unemployed for several months while I was applying for jobs and COVID was kind of at its um, most challenging peak is just try to make good use of your time. Even if you can't be doing the most lucrative thing or the thing that you would most prefer to be doing, if you can find something instructed to do, whether it's building a new skill, uh, maybe addressing the back end of your business, um, you know, that's gonna be something that you can then, when times are better, bring back in and have benefited from it. And I see Desiree is here and I'm sure she would love to talk, so. Yes. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, Desiree. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I am so sorry. <laughs> I am actually in the process of opening up my showroom right now. I open on Thursday. And so I'm like covered in paint, as you can see. <laughs> you're, you're still my favorite goldsmith in the world. Thank you. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is Desiree Cavalanchia who is our third panelist and you're coming in at a great time. So let me just ask you, Desiree, a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you could give a little background about what you studied in college, mm -hmm. what you're doing now and a little bit of your journey. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I went to Tyler school of art. I got my BFA from Tyler in 2015. And then immediately after that, I went to Fox School of Business and I was in the MS IME program. Um, I think a handful of people here are in that program. I loved it. It was wonderful. Um, but yeah, so right now I own a jewelry company. We do custom jewelry design and we hand fabricate everything in-house. So Actually, my degree is in metals, jewelry, and CAD CAM. So I do everything on the computer and we actually 3D print it right here. I have my 3D printer behind, <laughs> behind you guys. Um, and after that, we send it to a caster. They cast it into metal and I handpick all the stones myself. We organize them like this. Like I have, these are all for clients here. So I essentially lay out all the stones and show them what we can do. And then I do sketches for them and everything is exactly to each client's specification. So I work specifically with clients. I don't work with jewelry stores. Um, that being said, I also do a lot, obviously, because I run the business, I do all the back end work as well. So I work with our setters, our bench, bench girls. We have a bench girl here and then a marketing student from Temple that he actually just left five minutes ago um, that helped me out a little bit. And what else do I need to say? Um, my journey from there to here. Okay, so I have kind of a different journey than most people. I knew I always wanted to do art in high school. I wasn't really sure which direction I wanted to go with it. Um, I actually, my natural talent is in drawing. And I, upon going to Temple, I thought I would do that. After my first year, I kind of tweaked my path a little bit and stayed in art, but did metal jewelry and CAD cam. And that was specifically for the CAD degree that was really interesting to me. Um, I had always been a very mathematical person and very precise. I like very small detail oriented things. Um, so I went from there and I actually opened my company after working my first job. I worked at a gemstone dealer. It was very interesting. Um, I didn't love it all the time. I loved aspects of it. I learned a ton about gemstones. I learned a ton about running your own company, what to do, 
what not to do. That is kind of part of it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I ended up where I am today. I am the queen of jump on every single opportunity. <laughs> And whether or not you qualify, whether or not you think it's going to work out, I take every single risk that I can and jump on every opportunity that I can get my hands on. And that's why I'm, thank God, opening my <laughs> showroom today. So can you tell us about the showroom? Yeah. So, um, essentially with my, like I said, I work with clients directly. So the whole point of the showroom was to have a space to sit down and talk with my clients that reflected how high-end my end products are. So I sell, my price range is typically from like 500 bucks to $30,000. So that's like where my range falls of my products. And I obviously started my own company and I'm a startup. So I started in my basement and I was taking clients like at my kitchen table until like two days ago. <laughs> and so you got like, I kind of did what I could with what I could afford. And that was about three years of doing all of those things. Um, I guess even longer now, <laughs> but the showroom kind of has a seating area and then I'm going to have an area for all of my jewelry. And then I actually, so, I mean, this is, this is a quick offshoot, but this is something that all entrepreneurs should be thinking about. So if this is something that you're interested in doing, um, the way that you connect to your customers or my clients is a very important thing. So I find that I like to take a more personal approach of going to my clients. So I go to the gyms that they go to. Like what's a, my ideal client is a wealthy, like mid thirties to 50 year old woman. Those people go to SoulCycle. Those people go to Solid Core, SLT. And those people appreciate private parties in bougie locations. So I wanted to provide a really nice space where I have a big table that women can bring their girlfriends and we can have eight or nine people all designing their dream rings right there. They take pictures. They want to put it on social media. Look at all these diamonds on my hands. So I really wanted to come up with an opportunity like that for my clients to be able to essentially get me more clients without even trying. <laughs> Okay, so uh, for those in the audience, Desiree and Joshua and Jeff have all spoken in different ways about the same thing, which is put yourself in the environment where potential clients or mentors are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember, Desiree, you talking in the last... By the way, Desiree is a return guest because she was so impressive last year, we asked her back. But you were talking about how you go to the gyms and, you know, what some people might consider stalking people, but you would consider selling. Um, you can stalk people. That's fine. As long as you're not, like, infringing on their personal, like, being, telling someone, that's, that's how I've gotten all my influencers that have worked for me. I have sat next to them in Soul Cycle and been like, hey, um, so I make jewelry. I noticed you do this was wondering if you would want to wear one of my things. And they have seen me in class for the past three months sitting next to them. They feel like they know me. So, and they also feel like they're going to have to see me in class for the next three months. So they're not going to say no. <laughs> and that does happen a lot. <laughs> okay, great. okay. So a lot of the people in our audience today are thinking about starting freelancing businesses some have already started. So I'm going to ask a very broad question of the three of you. And I know it depends on the specifics, but overall, if people are wondering how to take a business they've already started, whether it be music, fine arts, consulting, tutoring, whatever, and sort of elevate it or jumpstart it to the next level, 
any general things you would recommend that you found effective for yourselves or for others? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'd be happy to jump in on this because I'm probably going to say something that's short and I'm sure Joshua and Desiree have much more interesting things to say. But I would say um, you have to be able to reconsider your approach to figure out what you've been doing and really attack it from a new angle. I think the thing that in my life I need, want, needed to like take up a step at one point was my teaching, um, both through Temple and as an adjunct teacher um, or professor going afterwards. And, you know, really... Be, be critical, figure out what I was doing in the classroom that was really effective and what I was doing that wasn't effective. And, you know, be a little bit brutal with myself and say, let's, you know, switch these things out, redo that, change that in a way that's, you know, it can be really uncomfortable to be that self-critical. But I think if you want to grow as an entrepreneur or in any career path, you have to be willing to like really, really, really reevaluate your path periodically. Um, well, I think that, um, well, everything that Jeff just said, but also, um, as, as a musician and as somebody who, who tries to, um, present music and promote music, I think what would take the music to the next level is to figure out ways to be community oriented besides just serving yourself. And that means serving the music that maybe that's a little philosophical, but, um, the way, the way I like to think of it is, um, if you're a star musician, you know, you're only around for however many years you play, but if you're able to build a community and build a self-sustaining community to keep the music going and going and going, you can last for another hundred years. So, Cause it's almost jazz has been around for over a hundred years now, basically. And uh, yeah, I think it, you take your, your ideas of lifting yourself up and just add other people. It, it could just be so much more fulfilling and uh, more meaningful. That's, yeah those were both very good very good points um i agree building community i mean it's so much cheaper to keep a client than to get a new one like if you can get someone coming back and back and back and if you can get them telling their sister about you or them telling their brother to oh like you should really get your engagement ring from so-and-so i got a deal like I did start by uh, underselling myself. Every artist does. It's terrible. I hated it. It was miserable, but it, it got people a taste of what I can give. And then when they come back, I don't give them a deal again. Like that was a, that was an entry level deal. <laughs> like you like my work, you have the money to like, I see the rings on your fingers. I know you can pay for it. So those things are so important. Also being critical with yourself is a great point, which Jeff mentioned. Um, I think with myself, I had to face the music of like, okay, I want $50,000 jobs. Is my stuff as perfect as $50,000 jobs actually warrants? And no, it wasn't. So I had to step up these couple of areas that I was working on. Um, also, I never, ever want people to forget about faking it until you make it. You have to fake it till you make it. Literally, nobody is going to trust you if you're like, uh, well, like, I could maybe make your engagement ring. No, no one is ever going to come to me. So I'm like, yeah, I can make your engagement ring. It's going to be awesome. I'm, I make awesome engagement rings. I'm great at it. Like, you just have to floor it and push yourself and tell people how awesome you are. Um, and if that means like taking a look at what you're doing and editing it, that's fine. And there's nothing embarrassing about that. I think that's also important to note. Like I even, when I'm feeling down about things, <laughs> my sister will say, yeah, but everyone thinks you're killing it. And like, that really does go a long way because if people don't think that you have the confidence, like in yourself, no one is going to be confident about your work with them. And why would they be? Like, I don't want an accountant who's like, uh, I don't really know. Like, I think I'm covering it all. Like, no, I, you want someone who's saying that they're crushing it, who's showing that they're crushing it, who's like showing rings that they've made and 
also like to that point, looking at your competitors and seeing what they're doing. What are they doing that's better than what you're doing? Or what are they doing that you can kind of take and make that your own? Like that's not you being a bad person, that's reality. And everyone's doing it to you. So if you're not gonna get in the game, then maybe it's not for you. And I've had to have that talk with myself. I mean, my dad has been on me. He owns a, his own business and has forever. And he's the first person that was like, you're being too nice. And like, if you can't hang, you have to get a new career. Like, if you can't take these hits, you can't. You can't like, if you're not willing to say, I did that wrong, shoot, I like need to go back to the drawing board, then maybe it's not for you. But like, my point is, there's just no shame in saying that. That's fine. You can reorganize and get it going a little bit more smoothly next time. Yeah, definitely. Um, to, to, to your point, Desiree, uh, fake it till you make it. That's, yeah, that's that's all music. Uh, I've been oh, in yeah. that situation many times, one specific time. I'd, uh, I'm, I'm not a very good clarinet player, but I had to play bass clarinet with uh, the, the Mingus band. And uh, it was... It was in New York and it was really stressful, but, and everybody was amazing and I, I faked it and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't hate me. So, but also uh, you're talking about failures. Uh, I think one of the biggest failures for me is knowing how to, to sell yourself properly. Uh, mm -hmm. We talked about that, Desiree, because I think there's a fine line between wanting to get all the experience you can and just letting people take advantage of you because they know you do something for kind of, kind of cheap. And then that's that's some some problems in the the music freelancing ecosystem, where uh, uh, especially in Philly, I won't say any names, but there's some places that like to hire student musicians who are from Temple. Me being one of them, when I went to Temple, um, and uh, just because they're willing to accept a lot less than people who they should be paying more, you know, and that, that's that's a really interesting dynamic. But yeah, selling yourself short, that's a, that's, I'm still working on it. Definitely. Well, that's just, so true. I'm sorry, go on, Jack. Yep. Just wanted to jump in and say, like, this whole conversation about fake it till you make it and be confident, super, super applies to job interviews as well. And I think that that's just another frame that people should keep in mind. You know, if you're looking in any interaction with a potential client is kind of like a little bit of a job interview. You need to be confident. You need to show your competency, but you know, not be brazen, not turn them off, but really be you know, a, that powerful presence. I think that that's just a really important lesson in a lot of different facets of our lives, even, even outside of kind of the specific world of freelancing. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Okay, two more quick questions and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. So what specific one thing would you advise our audience who's considering starting a freelancing or consulting business? What's the one thing you would tell them as they're considering this? Okay, I have a good one. <laughs> Resilience is key. Like just be willing to get back up as many times as humanly possible. For instance, um, 10, 10 days after opening my company, I got run over by a car. I had already quit my job. I couldn't walk for over a month. I missed my entire Christmas season because I opened my company on October 20th, 22nd. And then I got run over by a car on November 2nd. Um, and so... <laughs> that happens, whatever, you go through everything else, figure it out. Um, and once I finally was on my, like finally comfortable again, 2020 happened. And I had so many events planned last year and it was just like the entire year, instead of making a few hundred thousand dollars, I lost 50 grand. <laughs> so like resilience, is a number one thing to me. And that's like, I mean, in all of life, but it's so important for freelancing because people just step on you over and over again. And you have to be willing to be like, that person sucks, whatever. And then just 
go to the next person with the same amount of confidence that you had before that other person told you you were the worst person alive, you know? So that's my number one piece of advice. Be resilient. <laughs> Jeff? Yeah, I, I think resilience is super key and it's incredibly applicable to consulting as well. Sometimes you're going to have a really bad client interaction, you know, working with clients in any sense, and you have to be able to just bounce back and, and not get your feet knocked out from under view, come back exactly to the next one. Every bit is confident. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important, and this is always the advice I give to people considering PhDs as well, is think about why you want to do it and make sure you're doing it for reasons that are important to you and not because you think somebody else wants you to do it or you think it's the right next step, you know, for some more abstract reason, you know, make sure there's that personal motivation, that personal fire in, in large part, because I think in order to be as resilient as you need to be, you need to be doing it for you and not for somebody else. Joshua, your one point, piece of advice. So, um, what I'd say is specifically towards music, um, because jazz, well, like classical music, I guess any music, it's kind of built on apprenticeship and going to school for music is basically paying for apprenticeship. But if you can find somebody who you can, you really trust that, uh, unfortunately at Temple, there's a lot of people who are just so willing to help out, you know, give, give you the clothes off their back. You can find those people um, really try to get all the information you can out of them because, uh, you know, unfortunately, if they're up there, uh, I mean, as we've seen in COVID and COVID's really taken a huge toll on the jazz community, especially the elders, uh, when they're gone, all that information is gone too. And it's sad to think about, but, uh, you know, you got to take advantage of the elders and the, your mentors while you have a chance because after, you know, after they're gone, it's gone. Okay, so this is out of left field. What do each of you want to be doing in 10 years and expect to be doing in 10 years? I guess I'll go first. So uh, this is really broad. I just wanna still have a, a passion for music and have the desire to keep learning. Um, what, what I expect to be doing, I have no idea because I mean, I. I just started working at RTI literally today and I had no idea about it a month ago. So, and the things can change on a dime. So I'm not trying to uh, confine myself in a, in a box to, you know, I want to be doing this at age 30, you know, I'm, I'm just going to kind of go with the flow, but still keep in mind so that I want to help people through music. What's RTI, Rochester Technology Institute? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Rochester, yeah. But, uh, hey, but I, I went to U of R, so I know it. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be working there. And um, it is a, it just got this huge donation from uh, the Doris Duke Foundation and they have a big radio initiative. So really excited, but yeah, you, you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so. Congrats. Desiree? Yeah, first of all, congrats, Josh. That's huge. Um, but this sounds crazy. I'm sorry, I'm an artist. That's just who I am. But in 10 years, I want, I'm really hoping that I have an assistant <laughs> that can help me. <laughs> That's in a perfect world. Um, but I truly want young girls to be able to look at me and say, like, I can do it by myself without, like, I'm single. And I really want that to be something that girls can look at and be like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can own my own business and I can become a name that people know. Like I want in like, I don't know if this will happen in 10 years, but hopefully eventually my things, I really want them to be on the runway at the Oscars and the Golden Globes and all those things. And I want people to know, oh, does a dairy collection? I know, oh my God, they make the coolest jewelry. Like that's what I want to happen. So in 10 years, I want to at least be to the point where young women can look at me and feel like that's something to be proud of and something that's attainable for everybody. Very great. Jeff? 
Those are absolutely amazing ambitions, both of you. Um, I have no idea what I will be or want to be doing in 10 years. I want to be asking challenging questions and thinking about society's problems and figuring out how to help people through them in some kind of way. And that could be any number of things. I think consulting is a great step in that direction, but I don't know what the next steps look like for me. I hope I'm still teaching as well because I, I love teaching ethics and that's a real passion of mine. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to give the panel 30 seconds to rest. I just sent everyone a link to a very quick three-minute survey. If you would all fill that out, it's totally anonymous, but it helps us ensure that we're putting together programs that meet your needs. So if you could click there very quickly and fill that out. Also feel free to put any questions in the chat box. And what I'd say, Joshua, Jeff, and Desiree, if you want to put in the chat box the names of your organizations, you know, so people in the audience could follow up with you if they're interested, potential clients, um, you know, please share those websites or links just in the chat box. So maybe you get some mentees out of this or so some potential customers or clients. Okay, so there's the QR code for the survey. Okay, so let's see, do we have any questions? Okay, I see an old friend from class last semester. So what are the best recommendations and practices for individuals working nine to five that are attempting to manage freelance or entrepreneurial work in the evening or outside of their nine to five job? Anyone who would like? Um, so best recommendations, um, I mean, I, when I started my company, I was going to school at night and working 40 hours a week during the day. Um, burn the candle at both ends while you can, honestly, like that sounds crazy, but like you can't do it forever. And if you can do that until you're to a point where you can quit your job, um, because in all honesty, like that's when things start to happen. When you quit your, are able to quit your job, that's when things start moving and people take you a little bit more seriously. That was good advice that I received in school was like rip the bandaid, quit your job because once you take yourself seriously, people will start taking you seriously. But doing things at night, it sucks, but it is what it is and it's part of life. If you can set maybe Tuesday, Thursday, you work, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you take a little break after your nine to five and then you work all day Saturday. But I also, I truly feel like I'm a bad person to ask because I work seven days a week, like 24 seven. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I have a little bit of experience, not a, a, a dedicated nine to five, but I did student teach for a minute when I was at uh, doing a jazz uh, music education graduate school at, at Temple. And it was really difficult for me to, to balance. But as Desiree said, you just kind of have to kind of have to do it. And um, fortunately for me, by the time I was done teaching, most of my work, freelancing music work was at night. So, but you know, you just were exhaust yourself really quickly. So that, and that was also kind of a, a it let me realize that I don't think I can put in as much effort that I went to um, towards teaching and music performance and nonprofit stuff to really be successful. So I got to make some sacrifices and do one or the other. You know. 
Okay, so if I could ask a, a sort of an underlying question here, because a lot of people do, if you will, the side gigs. Potentially, A, they're not sure they can do the freelancing, but also sometimes for financial concerns. So can the three of you speak about sort of, let's say, the financial ramp up and how much or how long it takes to basically, in your mind, from the people all of you know, to get to at least break even or start making some money on your own? Okay, so an exact, there's no specific set time. Like, I can't say like, wait three years, you know? Um, I personally quit my job when I had like only $10,000 in my account. But I was like, that's enough for me. That's enough for my brain to go ahead and do it. But I would just be willing to guess people who haven't made the jump yet. And that's okay. Because same, I say this all the time, everybody is scared and it's okay that you're really scared. It's a really scary thing. Um, pulling the rug out from under you is really scary, but it does light a fire. And like, if that, if you have no choice, but to make money doing what you said you were going to do, you're going to make it happen because you have to pay your bills. And so like, I don't think that there's any set time or set of money, like amount of money that is safe to get started. Like the second you feel like you can truly floor it, then that's when you should do it. Jeff or Joshua? No. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, definitely for, for, for music as well, there's, not really a set time. I'm, I'm, I'm just very fortunate, and I know I'm very fortunate to be able to travel with a, a set band, but that's not always the case. But I, I've just been very fortunate. Um, but yeah, again, there's there's not really a set time, but as Desiree says, you know, it kind of lights that fire once you kind of have, you have to do something. So you kind of have to grind and lose sleep and sacrifice your personal life to, to do what you said you're going to do. And, uh, okay. Okay. So we have another question. How does one find their quote freelancing or consulting niche? And then when, you know, so Desiree, you could have gone into a lot of areas, right? Of arts, jewelry, crafts. Joshua, there's a lot of different things you could have done with jazz. Jeff, in terms of your consulting, lots of different types of firms or areas to focus. How do you sort of know, how do you identify the niche that's right for you? And then once you do that, how do you find your clients? Um, well, I guess the, I'll start off. Uh, maybe it's the, 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 the cross section between something that you're really passionate with and something that you see there's opportunity. Um, Right now, what I'm focusing on is really studying the history of, of the music. Being in a basic band is kind of, it's all about the history. It goes back 80 years, but there's so much history before that too. And there's a lot of history right here in Philly and uh, some history that not a lot of people are really talking about that I think should be celebrated. And it, it you know, it, when you kind of mix those things together, I think that it's motivation to keep going and, and try to make something out of it. Yeah, I think that my answer to that would be, you know, obviously leading with your passions and figuring out what's going to get you up in the morning, you know, what if, of all the niches, you know, maybe Desiree could have been a painter or a drawer or made jewelry and she picked the one that was right for her in that, but also kind of taking your skills seriously and thinking where you can really add value, where you're bringing something to the table that you think is unique and important because that's what your clients want to see. You know, when they hire you, they want them to see why they're paying you to do this and not that. And you need a good sense of kind of what that means for you first before you can really sell that story to your client. Okay. I think that those are all really good points, and I do agree. Um, also, part of me is going to say um, you're never going to like 
no, like I could have gone a thousand different ways and I'm sure you guys feel the same exact way and you would have done fine in all of them. So once you narrow it down to like three to five, you're good. Just pick one. Sorry, that's my, my dog keeps opening the door. That's why I keep getting up and shutting it. Um, but you could, you're going to lose years off your life, hoping that you do the right thing. My dad still says he doesn't know what he wants to do when he grows up. He's 75. And it's just, there are tons of things you can do. You just have to choose one and go with it. And like we've been talking about with resiliency, being honest with yourself, like if it's not working out, try a different one. If you feel like you have to leave that and do other things, then you can do that. Like I, I love painting, um, that, like I said, that's like, that's my natural talent is drawing and painting. Um, so I started doing those NFL cleats. I painted a handful of those to kind of like fill that void in my life. That doesn't end up being like a, it's not a very lucrative industry. Um, so I stopped doing it because it didn't make any sense. So there are opportunities to pivot along the way where you can pivot to something else, but you just got to choose one. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, another question. How do we, meaning people doing freelancing, consulting, selling their own work, how do they get seen as being qualified for the services they provide? I, I had an immediate gut reaction to this question, which is you need to be able to speak the language of other people in the field. You can be the most book smart person possible, but you know, as in the consulting industry, if you sit down at a table with clients, you might know everything in the world there is to know about oncology, but if you can't talk like a consultant at that table, you're not gonna be seen as credible. So figuring out not just the subject area, but the right language and cadence and flow and communication styles is absolutely critical. How do you do that, Jeff? Uh, I think that you do that First of all, by just trying to expose yourselves to those people and sitting back and doing a lot of listening, that's really important. And also in my mantra of kind of like uh, fail, uh, fail fast and hard, you know, fail fast and hard in low stakes ways. So you can make those mistakes, you know, where they don't matter as much and where they're not gonna really tank your career so that when you, you know, land the big fish and you land the big client, you're confident that you have that language and communication under your belt. Okay. So every, everything Jeff said can be applied exactly to music. Every single word you just said. So that's, that's my answer. Same. Everything you said. Cause like, there's no way to convince someone that I like that a girl in her basement is going to make an engagement ring. That's legit. And like, there's literally no way to convince them other than speaking the language. I know stones. I know diamonds. I also used to like, it worked for me in the beginning. I like was always very polished and professional. I mean, clearly I'm still keeping that up, but like now I can wear jeans and a t-shirt in my Desideri collection baseball cap and clients take me just as seriously. So once you're in, you're in and it'll be fine. But like language and things like that, if you have the knowledge and can convey that accurately to your client, that's all you can do. Okay. All right, good. Uh, any other questions? We're almost at our time limit. Oh, okay. Uh, Lindsay, someone wants to see the, is that the QR code for the Qualtrics survey? When I'm paying attention to the chat. No, I think they were asking for the suitable code and I'll, I'll share that at the end. Okay. All right. Then I would like to thank Joshua, Desiree, and Jeff, some great insights. Uh, you agree with each other a lot, so you must all be brilliant, right? Um, but some really good insights. I thank everyone for attending. Um, our next session is February 22nd on marketing. I strongly urge you to attend. It'll be a great session. And what we have found over the years, the three areas that people who freelance, consult, sell their own work, struggle with are marketing, 
how to talk about themselves and differentiate their brand and their offering, selling, and pricing. And so next, uh, on the 22nd, we're going to cover the marketing part and building your own brand. And so please come. You're welcome to tell your friends, your enemies, your family. And we'll be providing information. And Jeff, Desiree, and Joshua, thank you. It was great. And we are honored to have you here and look forward to staying in contact as the three of you continue to succeed. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Take care. Bye.